Now, a recent study by climate scientists at Dartmouth College has for the first time assessed the economic impacts that individual countries have caused on other nations through their contributions to global warming. Now, CNA's Julie Yu spoke to the author of the study, Christopher Callahan, of the Department of Geography at Dartmouth College about his research. The key finding of our work is that it's now possible to quantitatively link an individual actor, like a country's emissions, to global warming and therefore to the economic impacts of global warming in another country. For example, we find that the United States has caused over a trillion dollars in global economic losses, primarily in tropical countries that have contributed least to global warming, whereas many of those countries have not caused large effects because their emissions have not been large contributors to warming to date. The major emitters such as the United States and China we have linked to almost $2 trillion cumulatively, collectively, in many of the sort of lower-income tropical countries that suffer from warming because they are disproportionately warm, so increases in temperature harm them. Whereas if you're talking about a country that is cooler, like the United States, Canada, Russia, those countries have experienced billions of dollars in economic benefits from warming because cooler temperatures help crops grow and reduce cold-related mortality in these cold regions. It would seem that emissions are pretty hard to track and trace once they're released into the atmosphere. So tell us how your research managed to make sure direct correlations between the polluters and the effects of their actions. Yeah, so we take basically a three-step approach. The first thing we do is simulate an individual country's contributions to global mean temperature change. So we say, if the United States had not emitted what it did over the course of the last 25 years or so, what would have happened to global temperature? So we can quantify the United States or any other emitter's contribution to changes in the global average temperature. We can then use statistical relationships to say, when the global average temperature goes up, what happens to the temperature in another country like Angola or Russia or China? We can then use relationships between changes in a country's temperature and its economic growth to then link you know, a country's emissions to global temperature change, to local temperature change, to changes in economic output. So by creating an analytical framework that links emissions from individual countries to the losses and gains in every other country, what, are, what is your team hoping to achieve with this very study? We think there's two important things to take away. The first is the actual numbers. They're quite large. In the United States, China, other large emitters have caused substantial economic losses in other countries around the world. But also there's the finding that it is now possible to quantitatively draw these linkages. Independent of any of the individual numbers, the statement that an individual emitter is responsible for the harm caused by global warming in another country means that countries can no longer claim plausible deniability for the downstream impacts that their emissions have caused. Well, mounting costs and, uh, of climate damages, a question of who should pay for it and how it should be done is in the potentially one of the key agendas at the COP27. How important is that conversations over you know, loss and damage include a financing element? It's absolutely essential. Developing countries are calling for a financing facility to be developed at COP27 in order for money to flow from large emitters to the smaller emitters that have suffered most from warming. What our study shows that, that is that those financial impacts are quite large. And so I believe the takeaway from that needs to be that loss and damage conversations have to include a financial element to them. What do you think is the biggest reason that loss and damage has become so politicized? Is it because it's often tied to compensation? I think to some degree that's right. Yes, uh, major emitters have shown that they do not want to foot the bill for climate damages caused in uh, lower income and lower emitting countries. This may be partly because that bill would be quite large. And so a full accounting of the economic costs of warming, which would result in numbers even larger than the ones we present, would require very substantial financial outlays from major emitters. That's not a reason not to do it, though. I think it must be done. Yeah, I mean, there are those who are pushing back on the need for financing, arguing that the focus should instead be on supporting so-called mitigation projects. How would you respond to them? I think it has to be both. I think that contributions from major emitters 
both have to recognize the past harm that emissions have caused, and they have to contribute towards helping lower income countries make the adaptation and mitigation investments necessary to develop towards a low carbon future and reduce the impacts of ongoing global warming. Chris, before I let you go, what has to happen? I mean, what do you hope to see at COP27 so that you know, loss and damage is taken into account appropriately? I hope that the scientific information that's available now is combined with this really clear moral call from developing countries and lower emitting nations that major emitters can no longer avoid this responsibility. Their contributions are scientifically uh, and politically quite clear, uh, and so they can no longer be avoided. I hope that negotiators from both sides are able to recognize that very strong truth that is staring them in the face as we look at the floods in Pakistan, uh, and around the world that, that you know the the impacts that climate change has caused are no longer able to be swept under the rug they are staring us in the face